Well, good morning. Hope you're doing well today. It's Sunday school time again for August 29th. And uh, <clears throat> we're still in Proverbs. In fact, this is the last lesson we're going to do in Proverbs. And it's out of Proverbs 30, verses 24 through 38. Not 24 through 28, excuse me. Um, but it's entitled Big Lessons from Little Creatures. Um, so we know that, in fact, most, most, everyone knows that Solomon was the wisest man that lived, but why was he the wisest? Sometimes we, we forget why he has been dubbed the wisest man. Of course, Solomon succeeded his father, David, as the king, and, um, after he succeeded his father as king, the Lord came to Solomon one night and told him uh, he, could, he could ask for anything that he wanted. And in Kings, um, 1 Kings 3, 5 through 9 contains Solomon's story regarding his wisdom. And uh, this is what it says. At Gibeon, the Lord appeared to Solomon in a dream by night, and God said, Ask, what shall I give you? And Solomon said, You have shown mercy to your servant David, my father, because he walked before you in truth, in righteousness, and in uprightness of heart with you. You have continued this great kindness for him. You have given him a son to sit on his throne as it is this day. Now, O oh Lord, my God, you have made your servant king instead of my father, David, but I am a little child. I do not know how to go out or come in, and your servant is in the midst of your people whom you have chosen, a great people, too numerous to be numbered or counted. Therefore, give to your servant an understanding heart to judge your people that I might discern between good and evil, for who is able to judge this great people of yours? <laughs> so we see here in this, this scripture that Solomon requested an understanding heart for the people to be able to, <coughs> to judge the people. That's where his wisdom came on. It says in verses, uh, uh, the next three verses, 10 or four verses, 10 through 13 in, in uh, uh, 1 Kings chapter 3. This was the Lord's answer. It says, the speech pleased the Lord that Solomon had asked this thing. Then God said to him, because you have asked this thing and have not asked long life for yourself, nor have asked riches for yourself, nor have asked the life of your enemies, but have asked for yourself understanding to discern justice. Behold, I have done according to your words. See, I have given you a wise and understanding heart so that there, <clears throat> so that there has not been anyone like you before you, nor shall any like you arise after you. And I have also given you what you have not asked, both riches and honor, so that there shall not be anyone like you among the kings all your days. God had set Solomon apart, gave him a special gift. He was a Solomon because of what God did here in these scriptures for Solomon. And what Solomon desired was to be a good leader, to be a just leader. He was certainly an extraordinary individual. <clears throat> You know, there are many places in the scripture that references Solomon's wisdom. Um, in, in 1 Kings chapter 4, uh, Solomon spoke of the trees, the cedars of Lebanon, the hyssop that sprang out of the walls, spoke about the animals, the birds of the air, and the creeping things, as well as, as fish. He spoke about the plants, uh, he, he, the study of all types of creatures, including insects. Solomon was an expert 
on any of these subjects. In fact, people from all over the world at that time uh, came to seek Solomon's wisdom. So in today's lesson, Solomon has chosen to di discuss four little creatures. And uh, his, his opening comment concerning these uh, creatures can be found in verse 24 of Proverbs 30. It says, There are four things which are little on the earth, but they are exceedingly wise. Interesting, isn't it? Uh, so then we get into the very first section, and it is entitled, The Ant's Preparation. And this is out of verse 25. And Solomon begins with these ants, and he says, The ants are a, strong, are a people, not strong. <clears throat> we'll read the rest of that in just a minute. But, um, you know, I've, I've made comments in the past about the strength of an ant. Now Solomon says they're not strong here. Well, uh, just a few lessons ago, we studied a little bit about the ant, and and it was in that lesson it said that that an ant can pick up five times its own weight and carry it for a long distance. So how, why is Solomon saying here that ants are are people that are not strong? Uh, Just this past week, it reminds me, um, I realized how small an ant is and how I can take it in my fingers and I can crush it. And I did that because I apparently got into some ants and they started biting my ankles. I've got two or three bites to prove that they, 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 they delivered a painful bite. I grabbed that ant and I crushed it between my fingers. Um, that ant was totally defenseless. Could not stop me from crushing it. However, it did get the first lick in by biting me. Um, ants are, are one of God's creation, we know. Small in appearance, yet uh, the, and their appearance is insignificant. So what can we learn from an ant? Well, let's read the rest of verse 25. It says, Yet they prepare their food in the summer. The summer is, is when the food is in abundance. They're busy gathering and storing up food. Um, ants are made with that natural tendency to gather and store for the, the forthcoming wintertime. You know, ants could teach me and you that we need to teach our, our children how to be prepared. Uh, that's what they do. They do it naturally. <clears throat> we need to help our children be prepared physically. They need to eat proper nutrition and to exercise. I know that exercise word is really a dirty word for many of us, but we do need, I, I, I was reminded this week, um, I was sitting, no one else was in my office this week, and I, I spent the whole day there by myself. And because no one else was around, I didn't have to uh, go and, and, and work with them or anything. And I sat at my desk and, and worked on the computer all day, and I found out that if you sat there too long, when you get up, you, you can't walk very good. I need to move around more. I need to exercise to keep myself in, in, in shape. Um, <clears throat> we, if we sit around and do nothing, we soon lose the ability to move. Um, so how do, we, how do we teach our children and grandchildren children, this um, idea of, of being prepared, being prepared physically? Psalms 139.14 really is a very good place to start. Solomon's David penned these words. I will praise thee for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are thy works and that my soul knoweth right well. Children need to be taught that they are one of God's creations and that, that man was made in God's image. 
Uh, no other creature can say that. Uh, no other creation can say that. They, they need to be taught not to put these things, not to put things in their bodies that are harmful. Uh, we as parents and grandparents need to teach, start teaching these things to our kids and grandkids at a very early age. Just because um, as soon as you set a child down in front of a TV, we, we allow the outside world to begin teaching our children and our grandchildren. Uh, is that what we want? The TV bombards our children and youth. In fact, it also bombards us adults. Um, we get bombarded by the TV ads. We need to teach our children how to resist those temptations that they see each and every day. Uh, <clears throat> they're saturated from the outside world. We also need to, to prepare our children socially. In other words, how to get along. Our households, uh, are our household a proper learning environment for our children? How do us parents show respect, kindness, and love for one another? Because that is the classroom for our children and our grandchildren. You know what? It really means that we need to be the same at home, at work, or and at church. You know, sometimes we seem to be on our best behavior when we're at church. But really, we need to be consistent what the Lord would have us do at all times, whether it be at home or church. Well, what about manners? Where do children learn manners? That's from the home, from you and me. Then that we also need to teach them about financial matters. Remember the ant prepares for his future in the summer. He, he makes all that preparation. So how do children learn about financial accountability? Well, um, if your kids see you spending more money than you bring in, and you're always struggling, what does that teach them? They think that is the normal way. Um, if your, your credit cards are maxed out, they're gonna do the same thing. That's how what they've been taught. So helping our children learn to be good stewards of the things that God has provided will benefit them in today's society. Listen to some of these numbers that I, I found. In two, uh, 2020, the household debt climbed to $14.64 trillion, an increase of $85 billion just in the first quarter of that year. That we're talking about household debt now, okay? The household debt increased, but surprisingly, the, the credit card debt decreased. Don't get excited about that. The number says that the credit card debt per household is $7,500 annually. And that debt itself totals about almost $900 billion. So while it decreased a little bit in the credit card debt, we're still almost right at $900 billion in debt, just off of credit cards. That doesn't count all the other debt that we have. Also, children need to be educated. How are they gonna be educated? They need to be taught how to strive to gain knowledge. Um, one of the things that has recently, I can't remember where it was, whether it was, oops, sorry about that. Um, I think it was out west somewhere. It was either Oregon or, or Washington State. I don't remember. But they reduced the standards for getting out of high school. You know, we should not allow our, our educational institution to reduce the standards of what is required to pass a course. Why should we dumb down everything? It only hurts us in the long run hurts our children. 
It only places a greater burden upon our children when they become adults. They're not prepared. So we are responsible to educate. Then lastly, but the most important, children need to be prepared spiritually. Dr. Vine says it this way, and I, I can't add anything to it, so I'm just going to quote him. He says, life is like the seasons of year. There is the springtime, which reminds us of the days of childhood and youth, those carefree, happy days. Then there is the summertime, whose, day, uh, whose days of adulthood, the days of adulthood, they're, they are hot and heavy days when we are on the move. Then come the days of fall, which are the days of maturity and declining years of life. Last of all comes the days of winter. They are the years when we are moving toward death in eternity. If we don't prepare our children for spiritual matters in the future, we will have been unwise parents and grandparents. So back to the ants for just a minute. They teach us how to be prepared for the future. Future. <coughs> you might say, Tim, I've messed up my life. What can I do now? Well, there's no better place to start doing better than right now. And the ants can be used to prove this point. Have you ever kicked an ant hill down and see the ants swarm out? You've destroyed their, their home, what they've built. But what happens when that, that occurs? If you stand back and watch, those ants will swarm out of the hill and they'll begin immediately rebuilding. And if you walk off 30 minutes, come back in 30 minutes, you will see new growth of that anthill. In other words, they don't sit down and cry and moan and have a pity party. They get up and start rebuilding. So if we've made a mess of our life, at any age, there's always a time to, to begin again with the Lord's help. Well, the next section is called the Conies, and it's, then it's in, it says foundation. It's in the 26th verse. In the King James, it says the Conies are but a feeble folk. The, the New King James says the rock badgers are feeble folk, yet they make their homes in the crags or rocks. <clears throat> I wasn't sure what a Coney or a rock badger was, so I looked it up. And, and a coney or a rock badger is a rock hyrax, also called dassie, cape hyrax, a rock rabbit, and a coney is a mid, medium-sized terrestrial mammal, a navy to Africa and the Middle East. Okay, so now we know what a coney is. Now, some folks... I know in this particular definition, they, they say rock rabbit um, and everything, but it is more of a, a, of a rodent. It's, it is a rodent with long hair and, and short tails. Uh, what can we learn from this animal? Solomon says that conies are feeble people indicating the characteristics of them being weak or feeble. Um, they are vegetarians. They, and when they're seen, uh, seen, they have the tendency to gather together and uh, have conversations or conferences. So they gather together in groups. Because they are weak, they need a secure place to live and to hide from predators. The, the rest of the remaining part of verse 26, it says, yet they make their homes in the crags or the rocks. Uh, these rocks give them plenty of places to hide uh, from their enemies. You know, Paul told Timothy that, that all who live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecutions. That's found in 2 Timothy 3, 12. Um, uh, there will be 
predator seeking believers. Uh, you know, First Peter five eight is 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 one of the most quoted verses that we talk about in persecution. It says, "Be sober, be vigilant." Um, because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour. We, we know that persecution will come. How do we combat the devil in this 1 Peter 5, 8 verse where it talks about your adversary, the devil, will be roaming around seeking whom he may devour. How do we do, combat that? First of all, you got to have a firm foundation. Just as the conies depend on the rocks for protection, where they can get down in the rocks and hide, where their predators can't get to them. Believers must have a solid foundation of protection. So where do we find that? Dr. Vines reminds us of the, the, the story in Matthew of the wise man and the foolish man that both wanted to build a house. The wise man said he built his house upon the rock. The, the foolish man built his hand, uh, his house upon the sand. We know the little song, when the rains came down and the floods came up, the house on the, the, the rock stood fast, but the house on the, on the sand collapsed, didn't it? Um, <laughs> Robert and I just recently went to on vacation, we went to Hilton Head Island, and and we were on the beach one one day, and um, we didn't get very deep in the water. Robin, of course, with her broke arm and in a in a, a splint and everything, so she. But we pulled our chairs to the edge of the surf and sat there with our feet in the water, just enjoying the sunshine and and the breeze, and and the the tide was still coming in a little bit. So it got a little deeper around the chairs, but every time that tide came in and washed around our chairs and then went back out, the sand was eroded because of the wave action. And pretty soon I almost toppled over because my chair had, and one side, for some reason, the sand uh, went out from under that side of the chair and it almost toppled me over. So what is our foundation in life? You know, this comparison of the house is between a rock and sand. Well, it should be the word of God should be your and my foundation. Um, Dr. Vines makes this statement in the lesson uh, that I think it needs to be repeated until we remember it. He says, it does no good to only hear his words. Talking about his being God. The rest of what Dr. Vine says, we need to also heed his words. In other words, obey it. Uh, Psalms 119 tells us to hide his word in our heart so that we may not sin against him. Just as the conies scurry to the rocks for protection, Jesus should be your and my foundation, should be our, our protection that we can scurry to when we're assaulted by the enemy. You know, there's, there's many scriptures that talk about the Lord being our rock and our fortress. David said in, in uh, 2 Samuel 22, 2, the Lord is my rock, my fortress, and my deliverer. And every time I read that scripture and it says my fortress, I can't help but think of, of the song that Mar uh, Martin Luther penned back in 1529. A mighty fortress is our God. Uh, I'm going to try to share that song as sung by Greater Vision at the National Quartet Convention back, I think it was in 2015. But if you look on my my Go to YouTube, my YouTube channel, uh, search under Timothy Jewel at Del Rey Baptist Church. Uh, I'll try to put a link or a share there um, that you can go listen to, but it is it's such a fantastic 
song that reminds us where our fortress is, what our, where our foundation is. Our hope resides in Jesus Christ, our rock, our foundation. Everything is made possible by Christ and his willingness to die for you and me. There's another great hymn of the church entitled Rock of Ages. In that song, it says, let me hide myself in thee. Jesus is exactly where you and I need to hide ourselves from the, the dangers and predators of this life. So can we learn from the conies? Absolutely. We can understand that Jesus is our refuge and where we need to, to run to when we're assaulted by the evils of this life. The, the next section is called the locus, and it's talking about cooperation. Um, is there anything to say positive about locus? <laughs> I searched on uh, locus in the Bible, and as I read through all the scriptures that talk about locus, the scripture was a negative situation. Uh, there was one, perhaps only one that I found that wasn't necessarily uh, negative, but I'll, I'll leave that up to you. That verse says, John's clothes were made of camel's hair and he had a leather belt around his weight. His food was locust and wild honey. Now I can get on with the, the wild honey. I love honey, but I'm not sure I don't want to eat locusts. Uh, but that's what, not my choice of food, but, you know. Um, so in sort of a way, that, that verse is negative to me too. But then there's, there's this scripture in Revelation, and it's verses 3 through 7. And this is what it says. And out of the smoke, locusts came down on the earth and were given power like that of scorpions of the earth. They were told not to harm the grass of the earth or any plant or tree, but only those people who did not have the seal of God on their foreheads. They were not allowed to kill them, but only to torture them for five months. The agony they suffered was the, like that of the sting of a scorpion when it strikes. During those days, people will seek death, but will not find it. They will long to die, but death, would elude them. The locusts looked like uh, looked like a horse prepared for battle. On their heads they wore something like a crown of gold. Their faces resembled human faces. This is a, a it, it says these were locusts that came down. Of course, this is uh, obviously after the rapture occurs and those that do not weren't saved, weren't ready at the rapture time, are going to have to experience this unless they have become saved prior to these locusts, the locusts coming out of the, the pit uh, or out down upon the earth. <clears throat> if you look what, what Solomon says about the locusts in verse 27, he says, the locusts have no king, yet they all advance in ranks. Solomon is indicating that the locusts are wise. They teach us cooperation. Do we need cooperation? I think so. Uh, Dr. Vines included some information about locusts that I, I did not know. Uh, he, he says that locusts are actually... They start out as grasshoppers. Most grasshoppers remain in that stage its entire life. But some grasshoppers will attach itself to a twig and the grasshopper comes out of its body, blood rushes to its wings, and it becomes a locust and is able to fly great distances. Locusts will soar through the sky. They will join with other locusts and swarm over the land. 
Locusts can destroy vegetation, crops, trees. One of the, the greatest stories or, or dynamic stories of the Old Testament was when God sent the plague upon Egypt, the plague of locusts. After the locusts went through Egypt, there wasn't any green left in the, in the country. The locusts ate it all. But verse 27 here in Proverbs 30 says that the locusts have no king. They have no authority over them, no directive, no, no one leading them. Yet they all advance in rank. So what does this mean? It really means that when we receive salvation, you and I, it's done on an individual basis. In fact, if you look over in Ezekiel, it talks about there that everyone's responsible for its own salvation. However, when, when we become Christians, God does not want us to live in isolation. We should join in the Christian walk with fellow brothers and sisters. There is a phrase that is used throughout the New Testament when it's talking especially about Christians. The one another statements is what it's called. And it helps us understand. Let me just read. I, there's, there, I don't remember how many there was. It looks like I've got listed here 30, 30 of them. But let me just read a few of them. Love one another, John 13, 34 says. This command is referenced at least 16 times in the New Testament, that we should love one another. Galatians 5, 13 says, serve one another. Ephesians 4, 2, and verse 32, and then Colossians 3, 13 says, forgive one another. And then here's another one that, that uh, is important. First Thess Thessalonians 4, 18, comfort one another. You notice that all of these here, and, and here's a couple more, um, that one says, clothe yourself with humility towards one another. That's out of 1 Peter 5. And then James 5, 16 tells us to pray for one another. You notice that all of those are, are positive commands, aren't they? that we're supposed to do. But there are some negative ones. It's, it's telling us how we're not, we're, we should not treat one another. One of them says, do not slander one another or don't grumble against each other. You know, um, J Jesus told us to love one another. That first one I read, we can do much more in unity rather than a separatist you know, where we, we want to stand alone and be by ourselves. We, if we join forces, we can be much more effective, and, and uh, which means that we should be part of a local church. Not only part of a local church. When you say part of a church, you say, well, Tim, I'm a member of whatever. Yeah. But are you part of the church? Are you involved? We need to be involved. Notice the scripture about the locusts. It says, even though they don't have a king, they, they uh, what's the, the last part of that phrase there? Yet they all advance in ranks. In other words, they all go together. They do the same thing. They do what comes natural to them. That was inbred in them. And that's what they do. So we as Christians shouldn't want to be a separatist, but we should want to join together. Um, you know, we're, we're, when you become born again, you're part of the body of Christ. And whilst many people want to argue this, the Holy Spirit has given everyone at least one spiritual gift. Now, a lot of people say, well, I don't know what my spiritual gift is. Perhaps you should pray as Solomon did when he prayed that God would bless him with wisdom. If you don't know what your gift uh, is, 
maybe you should seek, you know, if, if you don't know what it is, maybe you should pray and, and seek the gift of cooperation with other Christians. The locust, as insignificant of an insect that it is, or I don't know if it's an insect or whatever you call it. Yeah, I guess it is an insect. Uh, it doesn't matter how insignificant it is. It is wise in that they cooperate with one another and they work together. The last one that we're going to talk about today is the spider. And it is talking about aspirations. Do you have any aspirations? The last verse today is verse 28. It says, The spider is skillfully grasped, grasped with its hands, and it is in the king's palaces. Now, Dr. Vines tells us in the lesson that the word Hebrew word translated as spider may not be the best translation. Other translate this Hebrew word as lizard. Um, in the context that it is in the lesson today, I don't think it matters whether you say it was a spider or a lizard. Either one will do. Uh, we'll just go with the spider, <laughs> just <laughs> for the fun of it. Um, what's this lesson from the spider that you and I need? It's a lesson of aspiration. Aspiration is a hope or ambition of achieving something. Do you aspire to do something? All right. The spider tells us uh, how we should, what we should do. We, should, can, we can learn from it. It says, the verse says that the spider has skillful hands, grasping of, of its hands. Um, and then you'll notice where it does this. It's in the king's palace. No, I've never been invited in a king's palace. Uh, but if I were, I would expect to see great finery, okay? Gold vessels, perhaps, valuable art, plush carpets, rugs, the finest furniture in the world. But I bet you that if you were able to look closely behind the grand tapestries hanging on the wall or the table coverings, you might see a spider or perhaps even a lizard. You know, you go into an old barn or old workshop. Are you surprised to see spider webs in there? Of course not. I'm not seeing, I'm not surprised to to see a spider in the corner of a room, anywhere, whether it be at church or at home or, or my work or anything like that. I don't care how hard you try to keep them out. They find a way in, don't they? This verse is telling us this is true even in the king's palace. If a spider finds the accommodations of the king's palace to appealing, the spider will weave a web and live there. In fact, a spider or a lizard uh, grabs hold and makes it happen, don't they? Um, I was changing out a light fixture on my house, on the garage, and I, I took the old light down and behind it was an electrical box, you know, and, and it's got a little cavity in there, um, and so, as I was taking the old light fixture out, undoing the wires and everything, all of a sudden I see up in the corner of the light box one of these little geckos or little lizards and everything. Of course, he ran out and took off and everything. But it's amazing those little lizards can find the smallest little place to get into. And uh, apparently he had lived there for quite a while, or she had, whatever it was. Uh, but our, the, here's a question. Are believers to have aspirations? Are we to have aspire to something? Put it that way. Well, let's go back 
to the definition of aspiration. It is a hope or ambition of achieving something. You know, Dr. Vines points out to us that too many believers have small aspirations. But there was one he mentions in the lesson, it's missionary William Carey, had tremendous aspirations. He said, expect great things from God, attempt great things for God. You know, you and I need to follow William Carey's example. But you might tell me, but William Carey was a great missionary. Yes, he was. I'm not. Well, do you think that William Carey was a great missionary on his own merits? No. William Carey was just like you and me. He had probably some flaws just like you and I have. The difference between William Carey and you and I sometimes is that we don't recognize, yet William Carey did, that he was not in control, but God was in control. God was, and still, even in today's crazy world we live in, he is in control. You know, a few years ago, our church, well, it's been several years ago now, our church went, went through the purpose-driven life. And the very first words in the study book was it's not about you, it's all about God. Whenever we can grasp that, get that in our heads, then we would be much better off. You know, we serve an awesome God, capable of great things. Absolutely nothing is too hard for God. I want to draw your attention back to William Carey's quote. Remember it says, expect great things from God. But the last part of his quote says, attempt great things for God. We must realize and understand that although, although God, uh, the God we serve is great and awesome, awesome in all respects, we as born again believers will be utter failures unless we realize who is in control and unless we attempt to do great things for God. How can God do great things if we're not obedient and willing to do what he calls us to do? You know, you, you may not think you're very great at the task that the Lord has given you, asked you to do. But can I tell you that because God has assigned the task to you and you alone, God is saying that you're the perfect person to carry out what he's wanting done. Just as the spider was determined to build its home wherever he wanted, including the king's palace. We should be just as determined to rely upon the Lord and aspire to do what the Lord tells us, whether it be great or small. Um, the wrap-up in today's lesson, Solomon uh, tells us in, in verse 24, which I opened up with, there are four things which are little on earth, but they are exceedingly wise. Now we need to decide if we'll be likewise, that we will be wise and learn from those small creatures before we study. Solomon tells us in Proverbs 7, 5, a wise man will hear and will increase learning. And a man of understanding shall attain until wise, uh, until wise counsels. Take the time to reflect upon these small creatures here 
and that they will teach us the importance of preparation as the ants show us in being prepared. The foundation, the rock in which the conies hide up in, up uh, within, and the locusts and their cooperation to work together. And of course, then the, um, the spider who has aspirations to live in the king's palace. Perhaps you and I can gain knowledge and, and understanding and have a more abundant life if we would follow the, the leadership or the, the directions or the, th the characteristics of these four creatures. I find these uh, lessons in Proverbs just really interesting. It gets me to thinking uh, about how to compare things in my own life and, and everything. So I, I, I hope you've enjoyed them. Uh, you know, like I say, this is the last, last week for Proverbs. So I'm looking forward to Ecclesiastes, I think, is next. All right, um, we need to go to the Lord in prayer. As I'm sure you've heard on the news this week, the awful situation that is in Afghanistan, what's going on there, the death of our soldiers that were bombed by the suicide bombers. Um, our nation is in a, a, a bad way, in my opinion. Um, so we just need to go to the Lord in prayer. And I, I have prayed several times over the last few weeks about the Lord stopping the evil people. You know, sometimes I wonder if, if some of our leadership has al already been given over to a reprobate mind, that there's no hope for them. We know that all through the Old Testament that God annihilated the children of Israel's enemies. We as Christians need to pray daily for our nation, for our country, and what's going on around the world. Are we on our knees praying for God's wrath to fall upon the evil ones? Yes, I think we should pray for salvation. But then there comes a time when God's wrath is going to do the work. And I pray that, that uh, America will get back to its roots, the roots of how this nation, this modern nation was founded, was on biblical truce. People came here because they were being persecuted in other parts of the world. And this would be a free world. And it seems like more and more we're, people are trying to, to change that. The question is, what are you and I doing about it? Are we praying, number one? And then uh, do we put our feet to our prayers? Do we go get involved? I pray that you do, and I, I, I pray that we will be able to come through this dark time we are currently in. But let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for your love and mercy. Lord, we just sometimes get so overwhelmed with what's going on around us that it makes it difficult for us to understand things and how things are and what we should do and, and how we should respond to things. But Lord, we know that you are just. We know that you despise evil. And Lord, we just lift these requests to you today that you would, your Holy Spirit would just stop evil in their tracks and that you can uh, uh, abolish <coughs> those that that have been given over to a reprobate mind that they they the, their intent is to do evil and not good lord we just pray that you would we know that you're in control lord we ask that you make yourself known and lord that through that there will be a great awakening of our nation and that many people will come to know your saving grace. Lord, we pray for those that are sick. 
whether it be physically or sin sick, Lord. We just lift them up to you. We're so concerned about those that do not know you. Lord, the, the scripture says that narrow is the way and not many people go along that way. And then there's another way that's broad and many of them go that way, Lord. We understand that's the difference between those that have accepted you as their personal savior and those that have rejected you. Lord, we pray that you give them a second chance or a third chance, whatever it is. But yet some way, somehow, they come to know your saving grace. Lord, we thank you for your mercy. We love you so much. Thank you for watching over us and providing for us and protecting us. We give you all the praise and honor and glory. And it's in Jesus' name I pray, amen. Well, God bless you. I hope you have, a, have had a great week and uh, look forward to seeing you soon. Love you guys.